This video is sponsored by PCBWay, and as you can see, I also just launched my first merch. Use the link in the description to get 20% off one of these super slick, high quality, limited edition shirts that perfectly shows off how big of a heart you have for interesting technology and engineering, all with my stylish red logo on the front. And of course, all of this is a huge lie. Well, except for the video being sponsored, that is. But there is only one of these shirts in the entire world, and I'm wearing it right now. Big thanks to my mom for making it for me. But before we go ahead building the gantry for my wooden 3D printer, I just wanted to let you guys know how f***ing sick I am of 3D printers. Ever since that stupid 3D printing hype gained traction on the internet, I've been getting it rubbed in, right, left, top, bottom, and in the middle. I'm so fed up with it, I prefer chucking one of these stupid devices right at this concrete wall over actually building one myself. So I hope you guys will excuse my not seeming as excited about this over the course of this series as I am about other projects. That is, if the series even continues in the first place, because if this video doesn't reach 350 views within the first week, I'll immediately put the entire 3D printer on ice indefinitely. I've had enough, seriously, I shouldn't have started in the first place. So it's on you guys to decide whether this keeps going or not, because I'm not going to make videos I don't even want to be making in the first place without getting extraordinary views. I could literally think of a hundred more interesting and useful things to make than a god darn 3D printer. And now that you know my actual, real, unfiltered opinion of 3D printers, how about we start building a 3D printer? Haha. <laughs> Starting off, I made a parts list for all the simple and straight parts the gantry is made of, and like I already mentioned a couple of times, the material I'm mostly going to use is 18mm Baltic birch plywood, like this here. This is all left over from the bandsaw build, which is also the reason why I didn't include it in the budget of the printer, since I built the bandsaw back in high school as a high school project, where I didn't pay for the materials. Speaking of budget, I'm also pretty glad I purchased all the components necessary last year, since nowadays with inflation, you're not gonna get even the most necessary parts for under $50. Looking at the stuff with the ruler, it turns out it's completely bent. Go figure. You're never gonna find a piece of any material that's totally flat, except this piece seems to be at least straight enough for me to use, and it should also easily be more than I actually need, since I really only need like 5 strips of 5 centimeters in width and 50 centimeters in length, which, including the curve of the table saw, would equate to a rectangle of about 27 by 50-ish centimeters, which is about this big. So let's start cutting these parts, keeping in mind later we still need to figure out which way around to actually use them in order to minimize the impact the slide bend has on the final printer. Oh my god, I wasted an eighth of an inch of this expensive plywood. Whatever, these are all the strips I need, as you can see they are not mind-blowingly precise, since if I put them all together, there's always this little gap left in between them, even if I put them all the way together, which hypothetically would mean all these cuts are slightly concave, although that can't really be possible, right? Anyway, next up, cutting them to length. Oh yeah, and I forgot, there's another 12mm wide strip of the same plywood, which I didn't include in my measurements since I had it laying around for a long time already, and I just designed it right into my printer, so I'm just cutting it to length now. Okay, I just decided that I'm not going to cut the x-axis to length just yet. Because if you remember in my last episode about designing this printer, I basically redesigned the entire X carriage, making it a lot wider than it was originally intended to be, which led to problems of the X carriage sticking out beyond the end of the X axis when fully at the end of its travel, which didn't leave me enough space to put a proper tensioning mechanism for my fishing line timing belt replacement. Well, this piece of wood, which is going to be the x-axis, currently is over 2 inches longer than it technically should be according to my plans. But I'm not really gaining anything by cutting it off, since that would just create another little square to be chucked into the box under the workbench. So I think I'm simply going to leave it as it is for now, since if it's actually too long, I can still shorten it later. And having it longer than my plans would actually solve a lot of problems, mainly with my timing belt tensioning mechanism. 
In that case, that should be it for the plywood for now, and we can move on to the cross members made of MDF. I always call them cross members, although technically speaking, cross members are part of a car. I just never know what these parts would be called otherwise. I really wanted to squeeze the other two parts of the Y frame onto this piece of MDF here, which, as you can tell from the screw holes, is left over from my second table saw, the one previous to this one, which I took apart again. But unfortunately, I simply cannot squeeze it on there without my second part going right over these big screw holes here. So, highly unfortunately, I need to cut into a nice fresh sheet of MDF. These are the front and the back of the Y-axis frame. What's next is the mounts for the Z-axis, and fortunately these are actually small enough that I can cut them from my good old table saw fence. Of course, these are all going to require many more holes and other stuff, but we're gonna worry about that later. For now, let's just put them where they belong, which is in between the Z-axis and the Y-axis frame. Last major parts to be done now are the so-called cross members going everywhere in between, made from a nice fresh sheet of 10mm MDF. I've been stashing the stuff for years now without ever using it, so I should probably start doing just that, otherwise the basement's just gonna overflow with hoarded stuff. Bada bing, bada bang, and bada bong. You know what's great about manufacturing services like the ones PCBWay offers? If you're so sick of 3D printing that you can't even stand hearing the word 3D printer anymore like I am, but you still crucially need some custom plastic parts for your project, you're actually not alone. PCBWay offers prints with most major 3D printing technologies, including SLS, no, it's nothing to do with NASA's obsolete rocket, which would be my favorite 3D printing technology alongside SLA resin printing if I weren't quite as fed up with 3D printing in general as I am. But it doesn't stop there. When I said most major 3D printing technologies, I meant that. PCBWay can 3D print your parts out of several kinds of metal, including titanium, just as well as out of plastic. I mean, I didn't even know it was possible to 3D print titanium in the first place, but oh well. Huge thanks again to them for sponsoring my content. Next, we need all the screw holes, and I already marked where they all go and picked the screws we're gonna put it together with. These are actually about to begin their second life as a screw, which is always great, aka these screws are all trash. So to figure out which way around to put the slight curvature of the linear rails like I mentioned earlier, I just want to clarify something first. In woodworking, these bars would be considered dead straight. However, this is not woodworking, this is engineering. And in engineering, there is no such thing as dead straight. There is only slightly bent, medium bent, and very bent. Fortunately, these soon-to-be linear rails fall under the slightly bent category, which I can easily prove to you by using my steel ruler, which happens to be also slightly bent, estimated 0.05 mm off over 50 cm. And if I plonk it on one side of the x-axis, you can see there is quite a gap for light to shine through. I can even shove a piece of paper underneath, no problem. 
Another easy way to figure out which way around slightly bent things are actually bent, if you can't see it by peering along the edge, is to drop them on the flattest surface you can find. One way around, they'll certainly want to rotate and spin freely, suggesting there's a single contact point balances on in the middle, and if you flip it around, suddenly it won't want to rotate anymore at all. Clearly there's friction on both ends, which means the thing is bent slightly upwards. With all the various bends mapped out that way and marked onto the parts themselves, we have several ways of arranging them. The first one being to put them in parallel. This would be a terrible choice, for quite obvious reasons. We do have to make the bends cancel each other out, leaving us with two options. One, a big, over-exaggerated barrel cross-section, and the other one, a concave lens. I am going to choose the concave lens for one reason. Usually, when printing small parts, the printer is more likely to be messing around in the middle of the print bit. Thus, the print bit is going to be messing around in the middle of the y-axis. So, as a result, it'll, over time, grind away at the linear rails in the middle of the y-axis. By using the concave lens option, over a long period of time, it'll probably just grind away the bulge of the rail, ending in the carriage being equally easy to move over the entire distance of the y-axis. If I choose the other option, it's easier to move in the middle and stiffer to move towards both ends, which means it'll grind away even more where there is already too little just increases the inequality between the points where the carriage is easy to move and where the carriage is difficult to move. And any inequalities in the torque required to move the carriage directly translates into imperfections in the print. Because the step of a stepper motor required to put out little torque will be bigger than the step of a stepper motor required to put out much torque. So as a result, the length of the steps, it won't be the exact same over the entire length of the y-axis. Now this is of course all just the obscure theory, my thought process, easy for me to think of, but difficult to put into words. I hope any of my reasoning made sense to you. I certainly hope none of the linear rails is going to be ground away over the lifetime of the printer. Furthermore, it turns out that these rails aren't straight in the other direction either. In fact, they are slightly bent this way. It's funny how easy it is to cut curvatures on the table saw, but to put them in I decided to make the bend face upwards, so as they'll presumably sag over time, they're just gonna straighten themselves out all by themselves. More difficult on the z-axis. Yes, we're also going to choose the concave lens, but here it's really not as important since on the z-axis the linear rails are actually attached to the edge of the board as opposed to the surface, meaning, as stupid as it may sound, we actually have to put them in parallel. Either this way or that way, doesn't matter, because if I inverse one of them, yes, they are going to cancel each other out, but only in the middle of the print bed. Nowhere else. Everywhere else is going to print something weirdly twisted on the XZ plane. That is my reasoning. Of course, I can't guarantee success building 3D printers with bent materials, but hey, at least we can try it. That being said, considering how inaccurate FDM 3D printing is in general, I really don't believe the little bend I have in these parts matters that much at all. In a nutshell, I just wasted several minutes explaining a theory that'll presumably never get proved. Or even disproved for that matter, but let's put it together anyways.
of course, in case you're wondering, no, assembling it at this point already doesn't make any sense, other than I need something to put on the thumbnail. Which is also why I didn't put much effort into making sure everything is square and straight, because we literally have to take it apart again right after to route the dovetail slots for my aluminum angle stock to slide into. And that's it for the first and possibly last episode of building my wooden 3D printer. I'm sure I have upset quite a few of you with the potential termination of this series, but keep in mind this is just to make sure I don't waste another entire year on a series that's only met with lukewarm interest on top of me not even really enjoying the project. 350 views is just a tad more than my other 3D printer videos had and should easily be surpassed if just a few people pulled their fingers out of their ass and did something for their free content. If the series does indeed end, you will find the full CAD model free to download in the video description, so those of you who want to build their printer along with mine can use it as a reference. And in that case, I say to those people, sorry for the inconvenience. If however you want to watch some better project, one that hasn't been done a freaking hundred times on YouTube already, where I'm actually in a good mood, I recommend watching this video about the amazing digital clock I made. Goodbye.